truth. Okay. Diphthong. 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 Everybody says diphthong. I didn't know that. Okay, so it's not very common to have difficulty producing vowels, but it does happen. So um, we have a guest speaker coming in a few weeks who's going to talk to us about childhood apraxia of speech. And in that particular disorder is usually when you'll see some vowel distortions. Um, it's, so it's usually not the case that you see this with your average bear. Um, so a lot of kids with articulation disorders and phonological disorders really won't struggle with vowels. Um, it is important to be able to analyze the transcript for, pal for patterns of vowel distortions. Um, things that may occur on tense versus lax vowels, high versus low vowels, back versus front vowels. Um, all vowels are voiced all the time and all are non-nasal, so they're all oral sounds all the time. Um, they are influenced greatly by the sounds around them. So you'll have vowel sounds that are not nasal, because no vowels are nasal, but may sound nasal, influenced by the co-articulation of sounds around them. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about vowels, it's really important to be able to transcribe them because there are some vowels that may be a facilitative environment for consonant, for certain consonants. So you may have a child who, say for example, has a hard time producing back sounds like K and G. It could be though that they are, they have a little bit easier time producing those back phony, back consonants when it's before a back vowel. So it's really important to know the front versus back vowels because it could be facilitating correct production for that child. And so whenever you're adding that vowel sound in the um, hierarchy we talked about, you know, starting with isolation and syllables, words, sentences, when you add a vowel sound to the syllable, you have to choose wisely. You can't just randomly choose vowel sounds because it could affect how it's actually producing the consonant. So it's really important to know where the vowels are made and how they could possibly facilitate consonant production. But vowels by themselves are not necessarily something that kids are going to struggle with. Most kids have all vowels by the age of three. Um, so vowels are produced with an open vocal tract. There's no points of constriction, so there's no um, nothing like a consonant that would actually constrict um, the phoneme production. Then when we have diphthongs, this is um, two vowel sounds happening at the same time. Uh, this is an, a gradual articulation movement, and that gradual movement changes the vowel just slightly. Um, the first vowel is called the unglide, and the second vowel is called the offglide. Um, have you seen this before? The vowel quadrilateral. Um, so this is just a representation of the mouth. Oh, I thought I had the mouth as the next one. Damn. Um, if you picture a profile here of like here's the nose and here's the mouth, this is a front high vowel, front low vowel, back high vowels, and back low vowels. And so this is kind of representing how in the mouth the tongue moves to produce these sounds, with some of these being um, more centralized. And we'll talk about transcription of all these as well. Um, this is distinctive feature chart <coughs> for vowels. So the distinctive feature chart we reviewed for consonants is also uh, um, present for vowels. So these are all your vowel sounds here, and then the possible features that can represent vowels. Okay, <coughs> so this is unstressed syllables and, and sounds. Um, <coughs> This is a very tricky concept that a lot of students have a difficulty with. So this is where we're going to start our phonetics lesson. Um, so all words in our language have stress. So there's, you're familiar with the idea of stress, not the stress you're feeling in this mm -hmm. moment, but the stress like that, you know, happens in words. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be like this, Stephanie. Um, so all words have stress. If they're multisyllabic, then the stress falls in a primary way on one of the on one of the syllables, in a secondary way on the second um, syllable, and tertiary way, and, and so on and so on, depending on how many syllables there are in a word. If a syllable just has, if a word just has one syllable, where would the stress fall? It's on its syllable level. On that syllable. If it's monosyllabic, that's stressed. So if it's a single syllable word, it's always stressed. And this is important because the phonemes that you use to transcribe certain vowel sounds change based on whether or not they're in a stressed or unstressed syllable. As an example, these two sounds in isolation sound the same, uh and uh. The difference is where, where they occur in the syllable. This is a stressed syllable. And this is an unstressed syllable. This is the upside down E. I realize it doesn't exactly look like it. 
schwa sound. This is unstressed and this is stressed. So if I have the word bus, what sound would I put here to transcribe bus? The carrot. And then if I had the word zebra, I would put this here because this is an unstressed syllable. So as an example, if I were to say the word zebra, if you can't hear the stress on the first syllable, I'll put the stress on the second syllable. Zebra. Zebra, zebra. Does that make sense? So if I transcribed it this way, it would be zebra as opposed to zebra. So the only thing that's changing is where I'm putting the stress. The sound itself is the same. Does that make sense? You guys probably can't all see this too well. Is that any better? Yeah? Question? Let's hear it. Isn't the schwa an upside down backwards? Mm -mm. It is, I'm sure. Oh, is it? Is that why it looks weird? Like yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so. So does this concept make sense of stress versus unstressed? Mm -hmm. The other sounds that are affected by this are the er sounds. So we have this er sound and this er sound. This is stressed. This is unstressed. So if I were to transcribe the word bird, would I use the big er or the little er? Bird, and then sorry, and then if I had a word like um, feather, little one. Feather. So this, if I had the other one, it would be feather. This is feather. Do you hear the stress? Makes sense. So another example. Well, this is my favorite thing ever. I don't know why it's a llama, but it's still hilarious. I want to be a schwa. It's never stressed. So it's another way to remember it. Um, so this sentence is another great example. You can say this sentence, I never said she stole my money, seven different ways, and it will change the meaning depending on where you put the stress. I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. Right? So you can keep going, and it completely changes the meaning of the sentence just by the stress. So it is important, and it is something that affects transcription, so it is something that you'll have to do, and we will practice together. Make sense? <coughs> so there's a big difference between the way that we transcribe speech and the way that we transcribe phonemes compared to how individuals who are in fields like linguistics think about phonemes and transcribe speech. So individuals who study linguistics are usually looking at the very nuanced differences um, of speech sounds across languages. And so they use not only broad transcription, which is our phonemes, but they also use narrow transcription, which are the little diacritic marks. Remember learning about those? We will not be using those at all. So if that relieves any sigh of relief, I see some looks that like, oh, I was hoping to say that. <laughs> um, so we're, we don't use that. There are a few that I find helpful. Um, the ones that indicate um, when a sound is nasal, because if a child is hypernasal or hyponasal, I find those useful. Um, and I'll send you sheets that have those on them. And then um, sometimes if a sound is aspirated versus not aspirated, I find that helpful um, in my assessment. But that's just kind of like a little note to myself. It's not something that I expect you guys to use in class ever. So you're not expected to use diacritics ever. And I'm only telling you that I use those minor ones because I find them clinically helpful. So if you do too, um, then that would be a way that you could use them. Um, but for our purposes, we're constantly thinking about connected speech. So we're, we test speech a lot of times um, it's at the single word level, but we're very rarely transcribing just one phoneme at a time. We're always transcribing words or syllables or connected speech. Um, as a result, we have a lot of factors that come from co-articulation. Co-articulation is when um, phonemes and words and sentences influence one another. Um, that kind of changes the phoneme's identity slightly because it's borrowing features from the sounds before it and the sounds after it. So we have two kinds of co-articulation. One is anticipatory, which is 
when a sound um, before this target sound is um, influenced by the features that it's um, that it's about to produce by um, by producing that sound. Um, so I have some examples. Like if we said the word <coughs> sneeze versus snooze, when you say the S N in sneeze. Your lips are spread like this, sneeze, because you're getting ready to produce the E sound. As opposed to snooze, neither S or N are normally lip round positions. But because you're getting ready to say the OO sound, you round your lips in anticipation. So snooze. You don't start out with snooze and then move that way. You can. But as a part of co articulation, we usually don't. Um. <laughs> it's the S the C, uh, the or is it like a vowel? It's the vowel. Oh. Yeah, so it's it's the way we produce the consonants lead in preparation for that vowel. Sneeze versus snooze. And also, just as a side note, I'm referring a lot of times to the sounds by their letters, but it's normally because, and I, that's kind of clinically a pet peeve of mine, but the way, reason I do it for class is so that you can hear me well, um, so I don't want to confuse my confuse you by saying S and N when I'm really referring to S and N, but I do it so that you can hear me well so that it's a little bit louder. Um, and then another example is retentive um, co-articulation, which is the preservation of certain features of a sound in sounds that come after that target sound. So as an example, um, <coughs> um, I think I have, I'm thinking of the, Um, like the word, um, sorry, I'm blanking. I thought I had some written down. Um, okay, well, I'm going to give you another example instead. So, um, as an example of um, co articulation, we'll contrast the words um, cat and can. So believe it or not, the, sa the vowel sound in the center of these words is the same. And the reason it sounds slightly different here, cat, can, is because this N is influencing the production of this vowel. Yikes. So we're having this co-articulation happen that makes this vowel sound sound nasal, but it's not a nasal vowel sound, it's just kind of anticipating that nasal sound coming up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, another example is the word emphasis. The way we produce the word emphasis, we don't usually, we kind of, um, we're anticipating that F sound coming, and so we produce the M sound as a labiodental emphasis instead of emphasis, which would be kind of cumbersome. So our system just makes these changes for us and, and for co-articulation, it's, it's ready to go and makes these changes. But um, if you were a linguist or a very, um, bless, you. bless you, if you were a linguist or very um, strict about phonetic transcription, this would need a diacritic to indicate that there is nasality here. Um, but we don't, we don't need to do that because we know there's nasality and we're not worried about that. What I would be worried about is if I transcribe this word that a child was saying and there was no nasality here. And so you can indicate that. Um, or you, know, you can even just write a note to yourself if those are things that you're noticing in a child's speech. Um, but as far as diacritics go, we're not going to use them because we're not being as um, specific to the, the individual phonemes. We're looking more at how co-articulation affects things. Okay. <coughs> so I'm going to skip over these unless you want to practice these together, if you want to practice these kinds of things together. Um, like, can you name a voiceless alveolar stop? Can you do these things? Do you want to do them together or do you want to do them on your own? <laughs> okay. Name a voiceless alveolar stop. Good. A voiced palatal apricot. Very good. Say the word toy, but add voicing to the first sound. Good. Tell me which sound is more anterior. Or sh. Good. So another trick for getting, if you have a child who can't produce sh or can't produce s, if they're substituting one for the other, so if they're doing S for all of their SH sounds. S and SH are very similar. You just scoot the tongue backwards a little bit and round your lips. So if you have the child produce and then just drag your tongue backwards slowly and round your lips, it turns it into an SH. So 
if they can follow those directions and actually do that, it usually gets you a pretty good SH right away. Um, okay. These are some more practice. Do you want to do these? You can do them on your own then. <laughs> and even more practice. Okay, so some reminders from phonetic transcription. <coughs> and then I'm going to open it up to any questions that you have about transcription. So these are like my pieces of advice plus advice that I have from teaching this online for the past few years. So try your best to listen to the sounds that you hear and forget the spelling of the word that you're trying to transcribe. So as an example, the word thumb has a B on the end when you spell it, but it does not produce that sound, it's a silent B. So don't get caught up on making those little mistakes about adding a silent E at the end, the silent Bs, any silent <coughs> letters. Try to really listen to just the sounds. This may be old hat for you, and hopefully it is, um, but if you're kind of rusty and feeling like you need a refresher, these are some of the common mistakes that I see. Listen to the speaker. So forget how you would write it or how you would say it and listen to the person who's speaking. In this class, it'll usually be me, the one giving the, the quizzes, but clinically it'll be the child you're listening to. So if they're doing something different from the way that you would produce that sound, you need to be very mindful of that. And I have an example of, of what I mean by that. Um, so these are just kind of little nitpicky things. So there's no punctuation in IPA, so you don't put periods at the end of your sentences. Um, capital and lowercase letters represent different sounds. And so if you write an uppercase M, for a lower, for a mm sound, it does not represent the mm sound. So points will be lost for that kind of stuff. Um, you usually see um, phonetic transcription happen in slashes, but you may also see brackets. We will use slashes exclusively, or you don't even, for our quizzes, you don't have to put them in slashes at all. You can just transcribe the words. Um, but we're almost always using this because this is phonemic transcription in which we're transcribing connected speech that has meaning. This is for phonetic transcription, which is just phones in isolation, not tied to meaning. Um, and then we already talked about diacritics. So for our purposes, use the slashes or don't <coughs> use it at all, but don't use the brackets. Um, we're familiar with this y sound. The y sound is not by a letter Y. It's a lowercase letter J is what that symbol looks like. We talked about these. Um, this is the sound we hear in, as an apple, so the way that I remember this particular phoneme is I think it actually looks like an apple, kind of. Mm -hmm. And it's the apple sound, so that's that phoneme. Um, that's, um, the, it's like an uppercase I is the vowel we hear in his, it. And this is a rounded back vowel. This is, uh, if you're from New Jersey, you make this sound. If you're from Pittsburgh, you do not. So this is like the difference between the word caught, like I'm going to sleep on a cot, and I caught the ball. Those are the same words in my language. Like that's, I don't produce those sounds any differently. So if you're transcribing my speech, this gets back to the listen to the speaker. If you're transcribing my speech and I say the word coffee, I said coffee. You might say coffee. But that's not what I said. That makes sense? So listen closely to the speaker and don't let how you would say it or how you hear it be influenced when you're transcribing. Make sense? Questions about that? Is it, can anybody do a good awe sound? Coffee. Good. So do you say like C O T and C A U G H T differently? Yeah. Sam? Cot and coffee. Oh, no, cot and cot. Cot and cot. Say it again. Cot. Well, now he's doing a lot, but cough, cough. Like, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that's, I, and that's, when I produce it, it sounds so exaggerated. It sounds no, like I'm, like, trying to, like, make fun of somebody. I say cough, I say cough. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. That's a great differentiation. Yeah. <coughs> Mary, Mary, Mary. Yes, yes. And so I say those three the same way. Yeah. So, my name is Mary, will you marry me, and Merry Christmas are all the same pronunciation for me. Wow. But I have friends from New Jersey and Philly that are like, no, it's Mary, Mary, something Mary, else. And I'm like, what? Yeah. So I don't, I don't produce this. But the point being, you're transcribing who you're listening to and not what you say. Unless you are transcribing what you say, then that's different. But if you're transcribing someone else, then you're transcribing what they say. This is a terrible repetition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had some questions on um, some of the transcription ones on, that you had. Up. There were ones like um, rank, like R A N K. Uh -huh.